Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 31st, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we use a recent letter to the editor from former ICER head Gunnar Knapp as a takeoff point to discuss various Alaska disconnects, and there are several. Second, we discuss the potential impact of a broadening dispute between the state and the Juneau School District over local contribution levels on the broader issue of state K-12 spending levels. And third, we look at the potential impact of inflation on construction costs in future capital budget debates. And now, let's join Michael. All right. Well, let's uh, dive into this, uh, Brad. We got a we got a lot to talk about today, um, and some stuff that I was not even aware of. It's interesting. But first, let's start off with a. This is kind of a classic uh, because Scott Goldsmith used to talk about this, uh, the Alaska disconnect. Uh, and uh, you're saying this recent article from Gunnar Knapp in the ADN is highlighting how that disconnect is uh, maybe bigger than we think. Let's uh, let's get into this here. Well, Gunner's uh, Gunner wrote a letter. Gunner Knapp, who former head of ICER, uh, one of the economists that uh, have talked a lot about which is the Institute for Socioeconomic Research at the University of Alaska Anchorage. I just for those of you who are just joining us and haven't been with us for years, <laughs> ICER is that. Okay, <laughs> That's right, shorthand. Um, so Gunner used to be the director of ICER uh, and uh, is one of those uh, economists that have has built a reputation uh, talking about Alaska fiscal policy uh, over the years, over the decades, actually. And uh, there was a letter to the ADN uh, a while back uh, talking about climate change and saying one of the benefits of climate change to Alaska would would, would be that we would have a bunch of climate change refugees uh, moving to Alaska, that Alaska would be uh, uh, a favorite spot for uh, for people moving uh, from uh, the lower 48 to get away from the weather. And in fact, I sometimes describe my, have described myself over the years as a humidity refugee. Uh, before moving to Alaska, I lived in uh, Dallas and Houston, spent a lot of time in Houston over the years, and, and I just finally had it with humidity. And, uh, and one of the reasons that uh, I finally moved up here was, uh, was to get away from the humidity. So it, th- that, that letter sort of resonated with me a little bit about you know, people moving here. But Gunner's response, I think, was an excellent one. Gunner uh, took the opportunity of that letter uh, to the editor to respond and say, look, um, yeah, it might be nice to have a bunch of people moving to Alaska, but, but the Alaska disconnect kicks in. And the Alaska disconnect is this uh, is this uh, 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 analysis that Scott Goldsmith of ICER, former director of ICER, also before Gunner, um, uh, Scott Goldsmith developed years ago and said, "Look, you know, people moving to Alaska might be nice, but it it increases the burden on the state because they don't bring with them or they don't contribute to the state state government the cost of state government when they come, since we don't have taxes." Uh, since they don't contribute to the cost of state government when they come, they contribute to the cost of local government to the extent local governments have property taxes or sales taxes, but they don't contribute to the cost of state government. Um, that that it's nice to have them when they when they come, but they don't contribute to the cost of state government. And in fact, they increase the burden. They increase 
the costs of state government because they increase the need for highways, they increase the need for public services to support that supports the population. Um, and, and, and the result is this disconnect between the benefit of having increased population and the, the cost, uh, the unreimbursed cost of that increased population uh, on, uh, on state government. And I thought that was, I, I mean, it was a, it was a well-written letter by Gunnar, very short, just, you know, brings a, just puts the Alaska disconnect back in front. But it reminded me that there's, there isn't just one Alaska disconnect. There are several Alaska disconnects. Uh, another example is when people say, well, my piece of legislation or my proposed infrastructure project or my uh, proposed activity is going to bring a bunch of jobs to Alaska. But those jobs don't produce revenue back to the state. They, they, they will produce employment. They'll produce, you know, an improvement in the quality of life for the families that are employed, but they don't produce revenue back to the state. So what Hammond, what, what Hammond, Hammond's term for this was selective dividends. What's going on in that situation is that the state is spending money, giving a dividend, if you will, and and in the in the current era where where the where the marginal source of revenue is PFD cuts, we truly are giving dividends, selective dividends, to individuals um, uh, for uh, to to help support their jobs. An example of that uh, that that you know my friends don't like me pointing out, but when when we have like the Hill Corp. Uh, discount on oil taxes when Hillcorp doesn't pay their full share of oil taxes. They don't oil taxes. They don't pay what what B what BP paid because Hillcorp's got a slightly different uh, corporate structure. When we have that sort of of discount or that sort of subsidy or that sort of of, of reduction in oil taxes, people say, well, it's because jobs. You know, Hillcorp Hillcorp employs people and they get jobs, but those those jobs don't contribute back to the state in terms of revenue like they do in other states. I mean, we don't even, in other states, it's indirect in terms of sales. In some states, it's indirect in terms of sales taxes. In other states, it's direct in terms of income taxes. But we don't have any of that here. So so we have, we have the disconnect between, yes, we want jobs. Yes, we want people employed. Yes, we want the private sector to grow through jobs. Um, but we don't, the state, the state, it increases the state's burden by having additional jobs particularly when the state has to pay for those jobs, either in terms of a state state spending or in terms of reduced revenue, as we have with the oil companies, um, uh, we, we, we have, we, we're, we're subsidizing those jobs. They're, those jobs are getting the benefit um, of selective dividends. There's another disconnect that, you know, and, and as I say, what Gunner's letter triggered was this, was this recollection that we have all these disconnects. There's a, another disconnect, when, uh, particularly when we use PFD cuts to fund to fund government. As Matt Berman from ICER has pointed out repeatedly, PFD cuts increase poverty. They because they are hugely regressive and take you know a huge chunk of income from lower middle and lower income Alaska families. They increase poverty. They move people toward in, from. From being marginally above the poverty level, or or perhaps more than marginally, given the size of the PFD cuts we have, more than marginally above the uh, above the poverty level, and move them move them below the poverty level when we take that income away from them. Well, what does that do? What that does is increase state government costs because we have a number of programs that trigger off then when right. people move below the poverty level. So so we've got we're, we're taking we're, we're cutting PFDs we're 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 taking that income out of lower middle and, and lower income Alaska families. They're increasing, increasing the burden on the state, increasing state government costs. And then what's the answer to that? Well, we cut PFD, PFDs more and we put more people into poverty. Is this, is this death spiral? Right. Uh, it's, it's the disconnect of the death spiral that we have. So what we've done in Alaska by saying, you know, we're a no tax state, we have taxes. PFD cuts are taxes. Matt Berman's told us that time and time again. Uh, but uh, but but we say we're a no tax state. But what that's really doing is 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 creating a situation in which, as Governor Hammond said, we have selective dividends. We have a selective dividend for for all the people for the people who move up here for climate reasons, uh, climate change refugees. We have selective dividends in that we in that we support them. 
uh, with state government services, just like we support the other uh, people, but we don't make them pay for it. Who we make pay for it is middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. We have selective dividends when we when we pass legislation or when we expand the state uh, payroll uh, because you know jobs. We got to have jobs. Well, those jobs aren't paying for aren't paying for state government. They aren't contributing toward the cost of state government. So that money's being taken out of the PFD now in the in the current era. Uh, and they're getting, those people are getting selective dividends. I mean, the oil companies are getting selective dividends from middle and lower income Alaska families in terms of PFD cuts. And, and the consequence of that is yet another disconnect, which is that we're pushing more people into poverty, increasing the cost of state government as a result of pushing people below the poverty level, and then taking more money out of the PFD and pushing more people uh, uh, below right. the poverty mm -hmm. level. So it's, it's, yeah. This state has one disconnect after another, and I think it's right. great that that Gunner uh, uh, highlighted one of them. Well, we and we haven't we made you know especially when when uh, when uh, Rob Myers was so good at kind of describing that disconnect of the between the public and the private economy, uh, he kind of dumbed it down for us. I mean, again, Gunner uh, and uh, well, Scott Goldsmith was talking about this years ago this disconnect, and we, and I'm just now making that connection. I find it ironic that the article talks specifically and and truthfully about the mechanism of how we are disconnected. But I also noticed that it doesn't talk about the stealth tax on Alaskans, where all the money goes straight to the government instead of to the people uh, to begin with, which is really the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem here is, is that government has remained unchecked because all that money is going straight to the government first thing. I mean, they're, it's not even passing through the people's hands. And uh, and I understand it's kind of outside the scope of that article, but that's the thing we need to remember is, <clears throat> first and foremost, we have a stealth tax in the form of all royalties are going directly to the state. Then we have the second tax of them taking the PFD on top of that. And it just exacerbates that disconnect. It's a it's it's frustrating. But there's the key to our problem right there. It, well, it is. Uh, it is. And 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 the diversion of that. Um, I mean, it, you, you correctly call it a stealth tax, it, the diversion of that to government, the diversion of revenues that are intended for Alaska citizens to government is, uh, is, is the beginning of the problem. But then government spending that money uh, without getting reimbursed for, for the, the expenditures, without, without those people who are benefiting from it, the selective dividendees, right. without those people who are benefiting from it, contributing back to the cost of government, um, is the is the second half of the problem? It's it's, it's it, it the 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 point here is there are a number of disconnects created in the Alaska economy by the way we've set up fiscal policy, and they have the perverse they have the perverse effect of of growing the growing the population without the population having to pay for the costs of 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 the of of the burden that they're creating on state government as a result of the growth, and we have the perverse effect of taking more and more from the, currently we have the perverse effect of taking more from more from the PFD, pushing more and more people in poverty, creating more and more costs for government, which right. just, you know, which is more and more from the like you said, it's that self-licking ice cream cone of creating dependency, feeding dependency, creating more dependency, then feeding that dependency, et cetera, et cetera, which we've talked about in the past. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate Gunner's article, but I, again, the one thing that people keep forgetting, I mean, I, I, every, anytime anybody's hit me with that, well, we don't pay taxes in Alaska. I'll say, let me break this down for you old school. And then we'll go back to the whole money going directly to the government and that disconnect and everything else. And they're like, well, blah, blah, blah. and, but that's the problem. We are creating a dependency state that in turn creates more of a dependency state. And that is a death spiral in the long run. I mean, because it's just, it's unsustainable. It's the definition of unsustainable. It is, it is uh, in, in, in various, in various forms, but we don't, I mean, Rob's made the point different ways um uh gunner makes the, the the point matt berman's made the matt berman from icers made the point uh, we don't tie people to government in this state uh people don't feel a responsibility towards you know keeping government under control because government provides to to you know the top 20 percent certainly government provides all the services that they ever want they provide the roads they provide infrastructure they provide you know, child care now, they provide K through 12, but it doesn't cost the top 20%. It doesn't cost, 
uh, uh, the decision makers and 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 the influence influence leaders and the and the the donor class doesn't cost them anything. So there's no tie, there's no connection between government and 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 that class in particular uh, that uh, that causes them to push back on government spending. They just want more and more and more of it. And and that's that disconnect is is sort of at the at the core. I think of of what has um, what has happened uh, to, uh, uh, to to state spending. I mean, state spending has gone out of control. It's gone out of control because because we haven't had that class in particular, the donor class, pushing back uh, on spending levels. Right. Um, well, and and of course, what's funny is that it seems like there's only a few of us that can see the forest through the trees on this thing. You and I have been talking about this for years. People like Scott Goldsmith, Gunnar Knapp, they've been, you know, arguing about this. I mean, they came up originally with that whole multiple lever thing and that the worst case scenario, the worst thing you could do had the most adverse impact was pulling on the PFD. And yet they continue to I mean, again, the legislature just continues to it's funny how they'll. They'll hold these guys, you know, the university and ICER, oh, they hold them up as this is the bastion of what we do. And then those guys say, please don't spend more than $3.9 billion because otherwise it's unsustainable. And they all go, oh, yes. And then <laughs> they immediately blow past it, right? I mean, it, if this is what, 2014? Uh, when we, you and I first started talking about some of this stuff in 2014, they were like, here's the thing. You can't go over 3.9 billion. If you do, then the model says it's bad in the long run. And then like, yes, okay. And then the next year, okay, now you can't go over 4.1 billion. And they're like, yes. And then they just threw up their hands and stopped giving the recommendations because obviously nobody's paying attention to it. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. It, and it's you're 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 spot on in terms of uh, you know the legislature. People in the legislature say, oh, listen, to ICER. ICER knows what they're doing. ICER's our economist. ICER really has a good handle on the uh, handle on the economy. And then ICER says, don't spend. <laughs> or, or if you're gonna spend, at least tax, at least make a connection between the people and the spending, so that so that people are pushing back on spending, and the legislature goes, ah, we're not gonna listen to them anymore. Let's find somebody else right. to bring yeah, in here yeah, and, and talk about this stuff because that doesn't that doesn't mesh with our philosophy of spend, 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 uh, uh, which is <clears throat> again, you know, totally, uh, totally problematic at this point, and. Uh, I, you know, I just, I just don't know. I don't know how to get the point across anymore. I mean, we just keep hammering at it and they just keep going, but it's, there's not a lot we can do at this point. No, until, until the donor class, until the top 20%, which includes almost all the legislature, by the way, right. until those people feel part of the burden um, uh of, of spending until they feel part of the cost of spending until they have to be connected to spending until there's a connection between them uh, and spending that we, it won't stop because right. it's just to them, it's just take more and more and more. And, and to them, it's like, it's free money. Right. I mean, well, and this is a uniquely Alaska problem, right? I mean, this is, it is. The, this is the only state in the nation that does it this way. We, this is a completely unique Alaska problem and it's going to, it's going to kill us in the long run. I mean, not fit literally, but fiscally it's going to kill us in the long run. Yeah. It's it. When, 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 uh, 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 various groups bring up, you know, Texas experts or DC experts or experts from, from elsewhere to talk about Alaska fiscal issues. I just sort of chuckle because no one understands the PFD. No one understands, no one gets the impact of the PFD and what PFD cuts do. ICER does, right. but you bring up people from other States and they don't. Um, all right. Well, that's number one. It's a good article. I've linked it up in the chat room. Let's go on to number two. Give me a tease before we go to break. Uh, number two is an emerging problem on the K through 12 side. It's not the K through 12 spending issue that we've talked about uh, ad nauseum on the show. Uh, and I've talked about in, in, in various, uh, various forums. Um, it is, it is a new K through 12 problem that frankly, I think is going to come back over and bite us uh, on the uh, on the on the on the current K through 12 problem we have, which is people pushing for increased K through 12 spending, the steps that the administration the administration is taking, they began it with the Juno ISD, and now they're expanding it to other uh, uh, school districts in the state. The steps the administration is taking, I think, is going to put more pressure on increasing 
uh, ha have the effect of putting more pressure on increasing K through 12 spending from the state. Uh, it's another one of those, one of the, another one of those death spirals uh, right. that uh, that we're that we're get, that we're getting into. Well, and this is the first time I've heard about this. I had not uh, did not know the state was doing this. So we're going to get the full rundown from you here in just a moment. Continuing now, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three, number two, a whole new change to K twelve that I didn't even know was out there or coming, and um, it could have serious ramifications. Brad, give us the background here before you jump into it. A good story uh, on this issue is in the Juno Empire, in this week's Juno Empire. It says, "State." the head, headline is, State Broadens Challenge of Outside the Cap Funding to All School Districts in Alaska. And this is an issue that started between the state and Juno, but it's now spread to uh, the remainder of the state. The, the, the core of the issue is this. Juno spends a lot of money, a lot of local money, in support of their state, in support of the their K through 12 uh, schools, they don't spend it directly in the school. the 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 money that goes into the schools support direct uh, state uh, support K through 12 directly is capped by state regulation, but they spend it on things like transportation, like sports activities, like other non core education. Uh, activities, and they've done that for a long time, and other school districts have done that for a long time. The state is starting to clamp down on that um, uh, heavily and, and saying that those things that you've been spending on, the money you've been spending on outside of core, core K through 12, has to be included uh, inside your cap. And if you're, if you're already spending up to your cap, in, in supporting K through 12 education, local funds in support of K through 12 education, core education, you can't spend any more uh, on, on these ancillary things. Uh, uh, what, they, what the local districts have thought is outside the cap, what the state's now saying is in, inside the cap. And in the middle of this article, here's the, they explain the issue. According to Lori Weed, the Department of Education school finance ma uh, manager, the letter to Juno was sent because the state in recent years and my thing just blips. So hang on a second. Because the state in recent years has failed federal disparity tests due to districts allocating, quote, special revenue funds, unquote, for purposes like pupil transportation. The disparity test is a little known ruling involving areas affected by federal impact aid, which for Alaskans means proving there is less than a 25 percent funding difference between the highest and the lowest and the lowest funded districts. Yep, thank you. So what's going on is the state is saying, look, the feds are including this stuff outside that the, the, the you have been saying is outside the cap. The state, the feds have been including that in their calculation of whether there's a 25% disparity between the best funded uh, 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 district in the state and the lowest funded district in the state. And we've been, the state has been violating that, that, that disparity test uh, as a result of what you've been spending outside the cap. And then as a result of violating the disparity test, the federal impact aid, which is important for some Bush districts, uh, uh, is, is at risk. Uh, and the federal government is at risk of withdrawing uh, that aid uh, in support of the Bush districts, uh, districts that have uh, uh, significant uh, federal activity in them. So you uh, or significant federal presence, ownership, uh, other things in them. So, so the way the state is responding to that is saying we're going to have to clamp down uh, on that spending that that you have said you the local districts have said is outside the cap. Bring it back inside the cap. Well, the problem with that then is that's effectively a cut to the to the to the districts that have been doing that. To tell to to say to Juno, you can no longer do that. You can no longer have this local aid that goes to these to these ancillary activities. Well, Juno is going to have to. Juno is saying, well, we're going to have to fund those ancillary activities in some fashion, um, and so we're going to have to cut spending elsewhere in order to in order to fund those uh, 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 activities uh, uh, through uh, through other sources of revenue. The net effect of that is to create cuts or to create uh, deficits in, in these school districts that have been funding outside the cap. And it's going to push them to increase state support for K through 12 right. um, to, to, make, to make up the difference. So we have a whole new um, impetus building uh, 
uh, behind increasing K through state support for K through 12 spending that's coming from this state action to clamp down uh, on spending uh, on spending outside what the district local districts have said is outside the cap. I'm not sure where this is going to end up, but we're going to see it show up in the next legislature in terms of districts like Juno, representatives from districts like Juno say we need to increase state spending because now you're not you're not <laughs> allowing us to use our local funds to support these things. You're saying it has to come from from state spending. So, OK, increase state spending to support those activities. Right. Well, and this is what my problem is with this. I mean, first and foremost, again, you're creating more dependency on the state uh, to, you know, and putting more pressure on that. Uh, secondly, what really irritates me is basically you got the state coming in and telling local communities who have made a decision in their communities to fund education more than what the state mandate is. And now they're saying, no, you can't spend more of your own money on that because it's wrong. This is the problem, again, because we become dependent on the federal impact aid and other things. It That dependency now creates its own barriers and hurdles on the edges and fences us into an untenable position. And that, I mean, it's it. For multiple reasons, this whole thing is just irritating to me. Donna says, how about raising the cap? How about we just raise the cap and then you can pay for your own stuff in your own communities outside of that? Well, you could you could do that. The problem is the the, the you're, you're dragged down by the lowest uh, uh, district. So you could raise the cap, but the lowest district might not uh, contribute uh, up to its cap. And as long as you have that disparity between the high end of federal, uh, the, 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 the high end of what's being contributed and the low end, if that's greater than 25 percent, then you've got federal impact aid uh, at risk. So just increasing the cap doesn't solve the problem that the states identified with federal impact aid. This is, again, the problem with government trying to pick winners and losers and saying everybody should be equally miserable, I guess, at this point. Because if a community wants to contribute, then they should be able to. If they don't, then you get what you pay for. I mean, right? That's kind of, that's that's real life. It's not government picking winners. and You can't go 25% over the lowest because reasons. And they're like, but wait, we could. I mean, that it's, 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 uh, anyway, it's, it's crazy. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, it's, it's being, it's being driven. I mean, at least the administration would say right now, this is being driven by, uh, uh, by the federal impact aid rule, uh, impact aid rule and putting at risk the federal impact aid, which is not an immaterial amount of, 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 of support for, uh, the localities, uh, uh, throughout the state. It's, um, I don't know what happened in my background. Um, it's, uh, 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 it's critical that uh, to the to the to the to the to the state what the state's saying. It's critical that we continue to get federal impact aid. So we've got to be driven by this federal federal rule. And so you, Juno, have got to have got to you know stop spending outside the cap in order to uh, in order to uh, 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 keep us within the federal the federal impact uh, aid uh, rules to keep those monies there. That's really the heart of the problem. If you want the federal lucre, you got to do what Uncle Sugar says. And if a community, for right or for wrong, I mean, I could agree whether or not we should all vote to have higher levels of spending outside the cap, quote unquote. Um, But if for right or for wrong, if a community decides that that's what they want to do, that should be their right. If they want the if they want all the bells and whistles and the gold plated toilets in their in their kids schools. And they all decide that's they they should be able and then the, the, the state to come in and say, no, you can't because somebody else in the state is not getting the same kind of education. It is, it's, oh, it's maddening. It's absolutely maddening. Uh, Texas went through this uh, a few decades ago. Uh, it was a, con- it was constitutionally driven. Uh, the Supreme court of Texas interpreted the constitution as saying that funding for school districts throughout the state had to be relatively equal with it within a certain band. And it led to all sorts of, of, of things School districts in Texas are, are funded largely by property taxes, local property taxes, and so some districts, the wealthy districts, had to give had to had to share a portion of their property taxes with the with the lower income districts, in order to equalize uh, revenue uh, 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 per, per per pupil revenue uh, uh, throughout the state. We haven't gotten to that point yet. Uh, but, but this federal rule is, is essentially doing the same thing. It's saying that you have to keep that spending within a band if you want to continue to get the, the, the federal revenue. 
and it's not, you know, the administra the Dunleavy administration would probably say if they're pressed on this issue, they will probably say it's not us. It's the federal, it's the federal government that's imposing this rule on us. To get federal aid, we have to have, we have to be within this band. And the it's not us that's interpreting the this this extra spending as being inside the cap. It's the federal government interpreting this extra spending as being inside the cap for purposes of applying the federal rule of being within this 25% ban. So they'll try to, they'll, they're going to try to lay it off. I would bet they're going to try to lay it off on the federal government and the federal government's rules. But the effect is, the effect is, the effect is to put pressure on the local districts, uh, on the, on the wealthy local districts who have been spending outside the cap for these ancillary services, uh, to put pressure on them to say, well, you're not going to let me spend, you're not going to let me raise it this way then you're going to have to, you, the state, are going to have to raise more. Uh, or you're going to have to raise K-12 through spending in order to keep our schools at the level that that we want them at. And we're going to drag the lower, the, the districts that, that, that aren't contributing, having that much local contribution, we're going to drag them along with us because we're going to increase state spending overall per, per pupil. Which again is just the dependency begets more dependency begets more, and and the 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 comment in the article about um, uh, the comment in the article about uh, you know this is Dunleavy creating a manufactured educational crisis and yeah, I mean but this you know in the long run they may cry about it now but overall what you're saying is essentially this may benefit all the school districts anyway because they may get more money from the state in the long run because the, because it's being forced in that way so maybe it's a crazy like a fox thing where dunleavy's doing, doing this in this end run around it to try and force the education increase in schools i i don't even know at this point well they're gonna they're gonna be they're gonna be very simplistic about it and say look it's the federal rule to get federal impact rate aid which is a material part of our revenue base and i and frankly i'm gonna have to go dig out exactly what that number is because you know, one way to avoid this is just say, okay, we'll do away with federal impact aid. We won't depend on it. But, but right now, federal impact aid, most people say, is is a material part of the revenue base. To maintain that federal impact aid, we're going to have to impose this rule uh, on the schools. And and I think it's probably the schools that are saying, okay, good. You know, we can use this to leverage up more statewide K through twelve spending uh, by uh, by saying, well, you know, Dunleavy administration is forcing us to. To, you know, we, we can't fund it locally anymore. So the Dunleavy administration is essentially saying we have to fund it statewide. All we can do is, is, uh, is, is, is you know, live by the statewide funding. So we're going to have to increase statewide funding. And the lower, the lower school districts are saying, wow, that's good. You know, cause we're going to get, we're going to get drug along with everybody else. We're going to get the benefit of that increased state spending also. I don't, it, it maybe, maybe it's Dunleavy, maybe it's the administration sort of, you know, being Machiavellian about how they're doing things. I, I don't think so. I think it's all being driven by the federal impact aid and, and and doing things that are being driven by what they're being told by the federal government are is required in order to maintain the federal impact aid. Well, I wish we could, uh, if Brad was only king for a day, if I gave you the magic scepter, Brad, you could fix all this, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I mean, I've got... <clears throat> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I, I don't know what the fix to this is. I mean, it, it, it's it's I, what I'm what I'm. It's an issue I haven't dived in, uh, uh, done a deep dive into yet. But it's an issue that you can just see where this is going. You can see the school district saying, "If you're not going to let me fund these this this myself, if you're not going to let me spend this additional money myself, you're going to have to provide the additional money because these are things we need." This is what we've decided we need. We were willing to fund it. You're telling us we can't fund it by ourselves. So these are things we need. You're going to have to provide the additional the additional money to do it. You can just see where this is going. I mean, Juno's already started saying that. Yeah. And, and, it's, and social, it's, it's social justice. It's also everybody's got to be equal. Now, you could all be equally miserable, but at least you're equal. That's the important part. As long as you're equally miserable, you are, in fact, equal. Even if you want to pay for more, even if you want to do something more for your community, you can't do it. It's it's maddening. Absolutely maddening. All right. Well, let's move on to number three. We got about three minutes here, Brad. So let's move on to number three real quick and we'll get a we'll get a take on it here. Hot take. So number three is uh some issues that have come up with um 
uh, uh, spending on the Cooper uh, Cooper Landing uh, bypass. Uh, uh, Alaska Public Media has got a story on it uh, that says, uh, with well with work well underway, Cooper Landing bypass costs more than double. Uh, the Peninsula Clarion has an article that says uh, bypass projects uh, costs jump. State looks for more funding, and they're talking about the costs of the of the uh, 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 Cooper Landing uh, by. Well, they're talking about the cost of the Cooper Landing bypass in this particular case, uh, jumping as a result of inflation and things that they're that they're not they're not abandoning the project. They're 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 finding different ways to time out the project to accommodate it. This is this is a problem. The, the impact of inflation on construction costs is a problem that's not only going to show up in Cooper Landing, it's going to show up throughout all sorts of uh, various uh, transportation projects that we have in the state, various infrastructure projects in the state, and it's going to it, it's going to uh, uh, become another pressure point in the legislature as they go through the budget cycle about how much to allocate uh, to the capital budget. There's going to be a lot of pressure to say, well, we've got all these projects we need to do, so we need to increase uh, the cost of these. Uh, we need to increase the, the, the appropriation of these projects uh, in order to account for inflation. And ironically enough, the inflation is dr being driven in part, at least, by the federal government's, I mean, one of the solutions they've talked about to the, to the Cooper Landing is, well, we'll just go get more federal aid. There's a big federal aid package out there and we'll get get more get more federal aid to help uh, help finance the cost. Well, the problem is the inf part of the problem is the inflation is being ca caused by all this federal money that's suddenly going into infrastructure and suddenly going into transportation projects, increasing demand for materials and increasing the price of the, of those materials, increasing demand for skilled workers and increasing the the labor costs associated uh, with these projects. So now. We've got we've got another sort of never ending cycle. We've got increased spending, uh, increased a flood of increased money coming out of the federal government, which is increasing inflation costs for, for this particular segment of, uh, of, of the budget. And now we're going to have to increase the state share of the budget to accommodate those increased spend that increased spending and or increased inflation. And it's just going to it's just going to keep spiraling on. Again, dependency begets dependency begets dependency. This is what happens when we are dependent on all that money. Well, now we got to dance to somebody else's tune. And that's the problem that we're seeing in all of these aspects. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. It's good to talk with you. Appreciate you coming on board. Michael, uh, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.